Existem muitos aspectos em que nós nos rejeitamos. A gente rejeita certas partes em nós. Aquela parte que é carente, aquela parte que parece que incomoda, coisas que a gente não gosta na gente mesmo. Para o vídeo de hoje, eu convidei o meu grande amigo Tom Compton. E o Tom tem esse jeito de olhar para essas partes em nós como se fossem crianças inocentes pedindo atenção. E eu chamei ele para uma entrevista para ele falar dessas nossas partes, crianças inocentes que precisam ser acolhidas por nós. O Tom tem feito o trabalho de Byron Katie durante mais de 20 anos e hoje dedica a sua vida a ajudar pessoas nesse processo da autoaceitação. Sem tempo, sem distância, no todo e no ínfimo, infinito, bem perto, escrito no seu destino, independente de condições, pessoas, caminho ou momento, aqui e agora, em cada batida do seu coração, o seu estado natural é ser felicidade. Hey Tom. Hi Katia. Hey. <laughs> hey. Thanks for being part of the show here. Yeah, oh, you're so welcome and, and thanks for including me in your world, really. Um, It's been lovely so far um, to, to be included in you, your world, and Jim's world, and you know, get to go to Brazil for the first time. And... Yeah, I so hope we go again and we do, and we do it again. <clears throat> yeah, me too. So. <laughs> so, Tom, for today, can you share a little bit with, with people that follow us on YouTube? about your view um, around the theme of self-love and self-acceptance? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a quote from Byron <clears throat> Katie comes to mind um, as a starting point. Uh, uh, but her quote is something like, uh, it's not your job to love me, it's mine. <clears throat> and. Uh, um, you know, a simple way to get in touch with that is um, just to look at anyone in your life and, and it's like that person, it's like their life purpose is to love me. That's why they're here on earth is to love me. That's their life purpose. Is that true? You know, and usually we can see right away. It's like, oh my God, no, that's... No, no one's purpose for being here is to love me. And so um, that naturally leaves one person for that job, and that would be me. That's, that's my life purpose, is to love me. And, um, <clears throat> and, you know, once you begin to realize it's no one else's job, then, um, then some real work, you know, productive work can be done on opening up to loving, loving oneself. But as long as you're stuck in believing, you know, it's someone else's job to do that, which, which just about every human being on the planet is stuck there. If, uh, uh, it, it gets in the way of, um, of beginning to form the habit of turning to me for the love that I'm looking for outside of me. And most people also have, who have struggled with this, which again, that's probably everyone, um, already have the understanding or the awareness that even when they get the love from the outside, it's not enough. And that's because the self-love is missing. You know, if I'm not already loving myself, then then usually I'm going to manipulate in some way to get the love that I feel is missing in my life um, from the outside. And because there's some manipulation involved, we don't trust it when it comes back to us, even if it's genuine. We won't fully trust it or we can't let it in. 
um, because the love for oneself is not present already. And, you know, I say like the love one for oneself is not present, which is, which is not actually the truth. Um, as far as I can tell, we are, our, our real nature is love itself. And which is a funny thing, because you could say there's a path from not loving myself to loving myself. But the end of that path is discovering that who and what I am, my real nature actually is love. And then we're more in love with loving and like loving myself is, is it's like not even an, an issue anymore, but there is this kind of step-by-step -step progression where most of us don't accept, don't love ourselves unconditionally. And then we move into self-acceptance. The next step would be self-love. And then eventually we begin to realize, Oh, my very nature is love. And we're much more, interested in just experiencing the love that I am than loving myself. <clears throat> so it's almost like the, it becomes a non-issue at that point. And it's all doable, you know, for, for, um, for everyone to know, or at least have the, be open to the possibility that it is doable. And, um, and the reason from my perspective that it's doable is because who we actually are is, is love itself. And so of course it would be doable for love to love everyone, including me. And which is also the most fun. It's, it's just the most fun way to live is um, uh, open, welcoming, loving of oneself and others. Um, so it's also fun. Um, another aspect of self-love, you know, another exercise that you can do around self-love is, um, um, is to begin to realize that self-hate doesn't work. And like we condemn ourselves, or we don't accept ourselves, or reject ourself. Um, but that self-hate, condemnation, rejection, it all comes from a very good place. It comes from a place that wants to change how we're showing up for the better in some way. <clears throat> and, um, and of course, you know, it's, it, sometimes it can get us to change habits or tendencies, but it usually comes through suppression or force or violence, some form of violence. And, um, um, and it, uh, do, it doesn't, it doesn't have the ability to turn into real love. You know, it just, it's just, it's like turning us into a trained dog, <laughs> you know, that has learned how to behave in a way that's acceptable to my own mind. Um, so uh, one, it's to realize that that rejection of oneself actually comes from a good place. It wants me to change for the better. So that part of me that's rejecting me isn't evil or bad or terrible. It's just misguided. You know, it's, a, it's, it's experimenting with a strategy that's not effective at all. So first to realize it comes from a good place, the self-rejection or self, even if it's self-hate, the strongest form of rejection comes from a good place, wants us to change for the better. And just realizing that can lighten things a little bit for us. And then, then the next step is to realize I've been experimenting with self-hate or self-rejection as a way to improve my life. And how's the experiment going? You know, just take in the results. And usually it's pretty easy to see mm, it's not really working. <laughs> You know, because as soon as I let up on the self-hate or self-rejection, you know, the quote-unquote misbehavior shows up again. Um, so the first to see the self-hate or self-rejection is not evil. Then to see that it doesn't work. And, um, and then the willingness to experiment in a completely new way which we all have the ability to do. 
So the opposite of self-hate or rejection is, to me, I call it conscious welcoming. And um, after 20 years of, of doing the work of Byron Katie, you could say my practice has simplified into this very simple living turnaround of consciously welcoming. And the best place to start is to consciously welcome the parts of ourself that we don't like. You know, as an example, maybe I have an issue with neediness. I'm, I show up needy and I've been hating myself for being needy, rejecting myself for being needy. And I, and most of us can see, and the neediness hasn't changed. Like the best that that can do is get me to be really good at hiding the neediness from other people, but I'm going to feel it. And, um, and so in that sense, it doesn't actually work. So then you can begin every time you're aware of the neediness showing up inside of you. Usually you'll be aware of the neediness, then the habit of rejection, you know, resistance or uh, and the strongest form of resistance is self-hate. But you be aware of the neediness, then the self-hate or rejection or resistance. And then as soon as you're aware of it, um, we have the opportunity to experiment in a new way. And most people um, are very aware of this, but they haven't realized that as soon as they're aware of what they're doing, there's a chance to do it differently. Because they usually go right into, oh God, I'm doing it again. You know, I'm doing the needy thing again. Oh, and now I'm doing the self-hate thing again instead of recognizing, oh no, I'm aware that I'm doing it. This is really positive. Because the, I, I mean, the moment we're aware, it can, it, can, it can all change in that moment. And just to begin to experiment with it. So I notice the neediness, I notice the self-rejection. And then as soon as I'm aware, I can invite myself to, wait a minute, what if I tried the complete opposite? I know this strategy doesn't work from, I've, you know, I've experimented with it since I was seven. You know, and I've given it a really good chance to work. <laughs> and so what if I just welcomed the neediness or let it in? You know, sometimes conscious welcoming might be a little stretch. But what if I let it in? That's kind of an intermediary step between welcoming, which is much closer to love, you know, uh, letting it in is closer to acceptance. But what if I let it in? I'm needy. And then what if I allowed myself to be curious? So just like noticing the self-hate comes from a good place, we can also begin to notice the neediness um, or whatever it is that you don't like about yourself. We, if we're curious about it, and, and that starts by letting it in, and then be curious. So I feel the neediness, and then it's like, it's almost like entering into a dialogue with that part of ourself. <clears throat> but you can invite the neediness to, to share once you let it in. And these parts of ourself, um, you know, they're very much like little children. And what I discovered over time is all these dysfunctional parts of me, the only thing that was lacking in their world was love. Um, but it's unconditional love. That's the only thing that actually works. But once they experience unconditional love, they completely relax. And, um, and ultimately, that dysfunctional part of us, it relaxes. It's basically, it's dissolving into who we are, which is this conscious welcoming presence. And um, so anyway, by it, the moment we let it in, usually there's going to be, everything's going to relax inside of us a little bit. And then once things relax then we can, that's when we can enter the dialogue. But that part of us will relax. It knows it's, be, it's finally being let in. 
and usually it'll open up just like a child opens up when it when it's welcome you know a child's hurt or upset or angry and you know it run it sees mom and if mom's in a welcoming mood which you know moms aren't always but when mom's in a welcoming mood that child opens up and it shares everything that's going on it doesn't hide anything it doesn't manipulate it just everything just spills out and that's the same with these parts of ourselves as soon as we let them in they open up and when they open up and we're listening um we begin to discover the innocence of those parts of ourselves that uh, so in the needy that needy one so say we let it in and it's like honey what is it you're needing you know and um it's like oh i need their attention or um you know i need to be the center of attention maybe you know which can bring up even more condemnation <laughs> you know it's bad enough just needing attention but oh i need to be the center of attention you know how criminal of you but but so then you discover oh it that part really believes it needs to be the center of attention and um usually we have prejudice or bias towards that but again if we're letting it in welcoming it and inviting it to share then you can ask it okay so now imagine you're the center of attention like you have exactly what you are needing and um and then you imagine it and then usually what you discover is oh now I'm the center of attention and what what do I want that for what would that allow it's like oh my god that allows me to relax and be myself and then all of a sudden you see oh this this needy thing that I've been labeling as bad wrong evil ugly you know pathetic whatever we begin to see oh what it really wants is to be able to relax and be itself And so as soon as we see that we'll naturally stop treating that part of ourselves like it's some kind of criminal that needs to be, you know, punished or locked up. Um so letting consciously welcoming these parts of ourselves, letting them in, inviting them to share, meeting them with understanding, those are all different forms of self-love. and um and ultimately the who we are doesn't need actually need love <laughs> it's um it's these parts of ourselves that are still hurt and i i refer to those parts of ourselves as who we're not um because uh, um the hurt which leads to the dysfunctional behavior that we normally reject in society or within ourselves um come comes from our beliefs our conclusions about experiences that we've had and um you know uh, after working with people for many many years um it, it becomes obvious cuz cuz one person maybe was beaten by their father as a child uh another person was sexually molested by some family member another person um um you know like didn't get the bicycle they wanted on christmas and they all have the same conclusion i'm not loved and so you begin to see working with people you begin to see oh my god the real pain is the conclusion that we make and then i've seen people that will treat themselves as if like they were a mass murderer because they lost their temper with their uh, uh with their child you know so um um as you begin to see these extreme reactions you be you also begin to see oh it's not coming from who we are it's not coming from what happened to us it's not coming from what i did it's coming from the beliefs that i hold about myself and others the conclusions that i've made um from experiences but you know most of us um most of us like as far as i can tell there aren't there isn't anyone that as a child grew up where 
they just lived in the environment of unconditional love. And so everyone has a, carries a doubt that they're deserving of love. And also the training that somehow love is to be earned. And so again, because I doubt that I'm loved and I start to unconsciously believe I have to earn love, well, then that leads to the, I need to show up perfectly. And, um, and then the self condemnation of trying to change my imperfections into perfection through rejection, because that's how we were conditioned. You know, everyone at the, at the, at the mildest experiences disapproval when they don't show up in a way that the parents um, like or are proud of or um, um, fearfully <laughs> want, you know, their child to avoid being that way. So everyone wrestles, wrestles with this and, and um, which can also be helpful because a lot of times people feel isolated or, you know, like I'm the only one that's wrestling with the self hate or lack of self love. And, um, and so it can be, that's one thing I love about group work is people begin to see, oh my God, I'm not the only one um, you know, suffering in this way or wrestling with this issue, uh, which helps to loosen up that belief that there, there's something terribly wrong with me. You know, everyone else seems to be doing a much better job at it. But when we be, when people begin to real, reveal their insides, we start to see, wow, we all um, suffer in such similar ways. And of course, you know, a big one is this self-love issue so anyway um, um just what came to mind now is, is um you know working with groups for many many years some people are like will say oh my god this it's so, this is such hard work you know there's so much it feels like i have so much work to do and it's such hard work and and um and i i like to respond with um you're worth it you're 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 worth all the effort, all the attention, all the all all the work necessary to, you know, uncover the love that you already are, um, which of course can feel like impossible <laughs> at times, but um, but it's in there. It's in each and every one of us. No no one no one got left out. Even though it feel, even though it feels like, feels that way, for most of us. So anyway, you're worth it. Yeah, that yeah. was very clear, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I'd like to ask you a question. It's yeah. from from a subscriber in the channel. Her name is Elaine. Yeah. And she. Sometimes in the channel, I tell people that we made mistakes in the past and we could look at ourselves in that time in the past and see our innocence and see that we behaved uh, we behaved with that part of us that you you call the little children that yeah. want something and and behave that way and made mistakes, maybe we hurt someone, maybe we did something we don't feel proud of. And then Elaine asked, well, but if we look at ourselves as little children and innocent, we will never be responsible for whatever we've done. Yeah, well, that's a common, that's a common fear that, that we all have. Um, um, and that, that you know that that fear that I won't take responsibility it it it, it maintains the self condemnation, which we mistake for taking responsibility, for um, uh, you know for any kind of harmful behavior. You know if I, if I've done done harm and um, but it's it doesn't actually work that way in practice. Um, um, but 
like your suggestion to look look at those parts of us as little children and 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 with little children it's easier to see they're innocent they don't know you know it's like the jesus saying you know forgive them for they know not what they do and um with little children it's easier to you could say make that assumption that they don't know what they're doing and it and it does come from an innocent place but it it's to work with the possibility that this behavior that i see may be caused harm somewhere in the world or to another person um to work with just to be open to the possibility that that it actually does come from an innocent place so to see the innocence doesn't mean how i acted was not harmful or hurtful you know so it's not saying it wasn't harmful it wasn't hurtful it's just to open to the possibility that it's coming from an innocent place a place of misunderstanding a, a place of confusion and um i like there's a byron katie quote that's easily misunderstood but she she says um uh, victims are violent people and she doesn't mean that you know someone who has been abused you know uh, physically abused sexually abused uh, you know any any kind of she's not saying a, a victim in that way as a violent person she's talking about internally when we have a sensation of being a victim um we lash out at the world and we can also lash out at ourselves but um when i first heard that quote you know i started to look at my own life i was just open to exploring because i uh, at that time i had a trust for byron katie i felt like she you know she was on to something good really good and um and so i started looking at my life reviewing my life and i noticed that there was never a time where i lashed out in some way at somebody not physically but you know we can lash out with our words we can lash out energetically but i i started looking and i couldn't i i couldn't find a single moment where i lashed out at somebody where i didn't feel like a victim first inside and um and so i began to see you know cuz uh um you know i didn't i i was practicing self hate at the time as a way to improve and uh, and whenever i noticed a, a kind of lashing out a defensiveness that was you know pointed at i i didn't like that about me and um so so helpful to to begin to see oh i'm feeling like a victim like i've been victimized in some way and i'm lashing out it was like okay well that makes a little more sense and so then i got curious i started welcoming the victim so i i would feel the impulse to lash out and now i had the awareness that there was a victim first so then rather than lash out i i could look and feel the victim in me and then i started to invite the victim to share you know which is the work of Byron Katie um you know what it was believing about what happened and i started to discover that again uh you know someone might have been mean or said a you know been critical of me but i began to see their criticism or even their meanness was not the actual cause of the victim inside of me the sensation of being a victim that was my belief so like if i needed if i really believed i needed their love and they were criticizing me i would feel hurt and i discovered oh it's not because they're criticizing me it's because i believe i need their love or um or or if they were criticizing me and um and i was already believing there wasn't room for me to be imperfect or uh, actually one of my favorite stories was that there's something wrong with me that was uh you know a very core <laughs> 
um, solid belief about who and what I am, something wrong with me. So if somebody criticized me, I would feel my own story that there's something wrong with me and I would feel hurt. And, and in that case, I would either lash out at them or I would lash out at me. But some form of lashing out would happen. Um, so beginning to see our innocence, it doesn't blind us to um, if I showed up in a way that was harmful to others. So we're not blind. But when we see our own innocence, we're able to, we're more able to apologize. We're more able to uh, act in a way that might not, not like make up for the harmful way, but to be able to acknowledge it, to own it, to apologize for it. And to, to even ask like, is there, you know, what, what could I do that would, um, you know, make this right between us? But if we haven't seen our own innocence, it makes it more difficult because we believe we deserve to be punished if we believe we're guilty, if we haven't seen our own innocence. But that, you know, the, the question from the viewer, it's a, it's a very common fear, um, which actually reveals the goodness that we are, you know, because it's like, I wouldn't want to, you know, I'd rather be guilty than not take responsibility for um, harmful behavior. Um, um, and, and so the question, the question reveals the goodness that we, that we are. Um, but some, most of the time we have to experience these things firsthand to know for sure what it's going to be like. In fact, everything, ha as far as I can tell, has to be experienced first. It, we, we won't know for sure until we experience it, what it's going to be like. Otherwise, it's just a projection um, related to our beliefs and fears. So, um, so I would invite the viewer to, to risk seeing her own innocence and then see if she, in seeing her own innocence, she addresses harmful behavior in a more responsible way because I, I find it actually supports us in being more responsible or responsible in a genuine way, you know, because a false, false responsibility is to condemn ourselves to do, you know, do the guilt thing, the self hate thing. Those are actually not taking responsibility. Those are, I find they're actually avoiding um, ways of avoiding really letting in how I showed up. But again, it makes sense if I have these beliefs that I'm bad, I'm wrong, I'm no good, I don't deserve love. Um, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to let anything in because it just reinforces I don't deserve love and I'm over here dying for love. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, Tom, thank you very much for your oh. view and... <laughs> Your clarity, you know, it's oh, very good. You're so welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you, Katya. Okay, thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks, sweetie, and and uh, <laughs> oh, look forward to hanging out together again. Okay, all right. Acredito que foram bastante claras as colocações do Tom e a pergunta que eu fiz para ele no final foi a pergunta da Elaine Silva que é uma pergunta assim, bastante pertinente, né? Se a gente se olhar como criança, será que a gente vai ser menos responsável pelos nossos atos? Então, eu gostei muito da resposta do Tom, que na verdade não. Se a gente se acolher e acolher essas partes nossas como crianças inocentes, a gente se coloca mais numa posição amorosa para resolver, seja lá qual tenha sido a atitude do passado da qual você se arrepende. E se você quiser conhecer um pouquinho mais do trabalho do Tom, nós fizemos uma série com ele, que foi a série da Costa Rica, que está aqui no canal, então procura aí é, séries pelo mundo Costa Rica, que tem lá um monte dos ensinamentos do Tom e várias das poesias que ele costuma ler nos eventos dele. E se você fala inglês e quiser saber mais do Tom, ele tem um site muito bacana chamado theworkwithtom.com 
e ali também, se você quiser, você pode marcar uma sessão com ele e experimentar esse trabalho maravilhoso de autoaceitação. E se você curtiu esse vídeo, deixa um gostei aqui para mim, deixe para mim o seu comentário e assine o canal Ser Felicidade. Um beijo!